He can find a seat this morning. As you do, find Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Why is it that we give our attention to God's Word? There are multiple reasons, but if you remember when we started our series in the book of Exodus, one of the challenges and notes that I struck is that as God's people, it should be our prayer that what remains of Egypt would get out of us. I don't know if you remember that phrase, but one of the means by which that happens for God's people is that we regularly, consistently are saturated in God's Word. God's Word is a mirror unto our soul. And it is powerful and effective. And so we believe in God's word that these ancient words have contemporary relevance. And today we have a daunting task in front of us, 21, 22, and 23. So if you're new or newer to Hope Church, uh, I apologize up front just a little bit. Someone, a good friend, asked me before the service, do you feel like it's long-winded today or short? And I said, well, we had a little brief conversation about that. So nonetheless... Uh, We're going to fly through a lot of stuff today. It will be a little bit different from 21 through 23 because we're not going to give attention to every nuance, every paragraph, every sentence. However, our regular diet is to walk through the word systematically. And so, but this, this section of scripture, if you remember a few weeks ago, is actually what's called the scroll of the law. So if you go back to chapter 19 through chapter 23... It is one section of Scripture, and so uh, typically called the scroll of the law, which is embedded in there what systematically and regularly people are familiar with in regards to the Ten Commandments. But there's more than just the Ten Commandments, Uh, and so we're going to give our attention really to these three chapters. And the title of the message, if you are taking notes, is Doing Justice, Making Jesus Look Glorious. And that's important. It's purposeful. And there's a lot around this, and just a little caveat, there's going to be multiple caveats today, but... Uh, Not everything can be said about this subject, particularly justice, in one talk. And I know it's a hot-button issue, but hopefully our view of justice would not be culturally driven, but theologically driven. And we find a lot of that in this section of Scripture. But you have to understand that the making Jesus look glorious part is where we specifically take this back from the culture, this idea, and we see that God has cared often about this issue long before contemporary audiences. And so I'm reminded of Micah 6, 8, when you think about uh, just this idea, what what is it, man, what's good? This is what Micah says, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. There's enough meat there for an entire message, but I was thinking as we were singing this morning, how interesting, how important that we who stand in the stream of mercy are the ones who are to act justly, to do justice, and to walk humbly with our God. And so this section of Scripture, though, there's a a lot of preliminary remarks here that I think are important that will help us get to it, but we have to understand what's at play. One of the things that's at play in this section of Scripture, to go back to our previous two messages, is what God is doing through Moses and in the giving of the law is actually orienting his people on two fronts, all right? So this is the reminder. And that is, how is it that we love God rightly, and how is it that we love one another rightly? And so it's important that we frame this. That actually, that impulse is still happening in this text, in this long section of Scripture. Specifically so, how is the law to be applied? We move from um, really... Uh, prohibitions in the Decalogue to definitive objective statements now to how is the law to be applied in real life? How is it to work itself out in relationships? In this essence, and the the reason why is because God's people are to make God look glorious. Uh, You could think of it this way. Israel was to be an advertisement for Yahweh, right? Christopher Wright has written this. He says that this whole section is to make Yahweh look good. So it is with us today, right? Think about it this way. God's people right now, right here at Hope Church, in this community and in our sphere of influence, we are to live such a way that we make Jesus look glorious, right? So the orientation of our life, this is very practical. How many of you love practicality, by the way? A lot of practicality today, and we'll get there. But these sections of Scripture, verses 21 through 23, are glorious These could be considered the rules or the judgments, and they teach us, again, how the law is to be applied. They help actually make justice a reality rather than a blog, okay? So just food for thought. 
In very similar fashion, and I would even add more profound way, Jesus takes up this same idea classically in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you love the Sermon on the Mount, by the way? That Jesus is the embodiment of all that the Old Testament would teach us. Messiah is now come, and Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, takes up this same idea that God's people, Christians, the church, is to actually make Jesus look glorious. We are to live out that light uh, on a hill, right? That, that light in the darkness. And so Jesus takes this and makes it even more profound. Craig Bloomberg in his uh, New Testament survey has said this about the Sermon on the Mount, and I think it connects. He says this, It forms the manifesto by which the new community Jesus is forming should live. But the church must permeate society with these ideas. Now listen to this, albeit in a pervasive, or excuse me, persuasive way, rather than a coercive fashion. That is important, okay? I know there's a lot of technical language here, but this is important, that we should be a persuasive, uh, really uh, apologetic to the truth of the gospel. And so we see this. And so as we read this section, we, would th- we should think in a few terms, okay? One, as we look at these three, se- I'm going to divide it by three sections, you should think, I should think in three ways. One, responsibility, Okay? Two, we should think in regards to justice. And then ultimately, we should think in terms of holiness. So responsibility, justice, and holiness. Can you bear with me for just a few more minutes on preliminary remarks before we get into the text, okay? Because it's so important. So let me give you some preliminary matters before we jump into these three sections. First of all, this is a long section of Scripture. So if you're there as a Pharisee evaluating me... um, Come back next Sunday and give me, give me another chance, okay? All right? But it's a very long section, and it's important. It's, it's really, really important. Uh, what you see is that this section of Scripture is magnifying the issue of society and even family in light of depravity, in light of sinfulness, okay? Secondly, real quick, so it's a long section. We get that. Two, civil organization is part of the way that God's world works, Okay? So authority, structure, and order are actually critical to restrain evil, make justice happen, and offer a means for human flourishing. Justice works itself out by taking responsibility, not writing blogs. Okay? Little angst there. I think you got that. Um, And here's a big one that you're going to see. You're going to see this in the text. Justice worked out actually includes severe consequences. This is all over this section. That when you see justice worked out, there are punitive things at play. So for example, this is where the death penalty pops up. It is a severe matter. I would suggest to you, though, in the text, it's not unjust. We'll we'll see that, hopefully, and be helped. Now, the process can be corrupted. And so there are times, I think, that Christians should very rightly oppose situations in that regards, but on its face, we have to understand principally that justice worked out, worked out in society requires punitive matters, situations, consequences. So that's number three. Number four, quickly, and this is important. In this section, you're going to see that there is a major emphasis on the vulnerable. Major emphasis in the vulner- on the vulnerable. Um, The Bible does not work itself out to oppress people, as some would say. That is a misreading of the text. The vulnerable are valued in the Scriptures, so we see that. Fifth, and this is important, there is an unquestionable value placed on life versus property, livestock, and resources. We see that in the text. Number six, the judgments of God, what we're about to read actually work to eliminate loopholes for the wealthy and powerful as compared to other cultures during that day. And this is important. So, for example, there was another Babylonian code of Hammurabi technical stuff that in that code for that culture, for those people, there were actually loopholes for the wealthy and for the powerful to actually get out of things. And what's beautiful about the law of God is it levels the playing field that the powerful and the poor are held accountable. And so it restricts the potential abuse of consequences. And this is important when you think about how the Bible works. 
So we see this. And then lastly, and hear this before we jump in, perfect justice and harmony is a future promise. Let me say that again. Perfect justice and harmony is a future promise, not a contemporary possibility. The already not yet tension of the Bible is actually at play here. The day that the lion will lay down with the lamb is still future. Okay, so we live within that tension. So here we go. How is it that we, how is it that we are to love neighbor? Chapters 21 through 23, how does it fit into this? And so here's the three divisions, okay? Let me go ahead and give you the three divisions. First, we are to protect the vulnerable. First, we are to protect the vulnerable. Second, we see that the guilty are to be held accountable. And then lastly, God's people must maintain a priority of holiness in our work and desire for justice. So here it is again, big three, okay? One, we work to protect the vulnerable. Secondly, we have to understand that behavior matters, that people are to be held accountable. And lastly, God's people are to maintain the priority of holiness as we think about these social norms. Okay, so here we go. Let's get to work. How is it that we see the protection for the vulnerable? Let's jump in at verse, 20, verse 1 of 21 down through this first section. Now, these are the rules or judgments that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. Now, right off the bat, we see, it sort of seems, okay, wow, right? And so one of the things that in reading the Bible we have to understand is that we are very far removed from the cultural norm in which this was first written. And this issue of slavery, this issue of slave that pops up in the Bible is something that has, one, been misinterpreted and misapplied. So what I would suggest to you is that we see within this agrarian society that God is actually working to protect the vulnerable, to protect and even order what's called the master-servant relationship. So we must be very careful here, okay? We cannot take our modern view of slavery and impose it on this text. That's typically what happens because when we read a word, slave, what we begin to do in our day is we begin to think about oppressive, evil slavery. And I would suggest to you that the Bible, even this passage, and there's certain things that are even later in 21, that would actually suggest explicitly so that oppressive, evil stealing of someone, this idea of harming someone, is not what's at play in this text. So this culture, this agrarian, agrarian culture, was dependent upon the master-servant relationship. This is not the evil, oppressive stealing of someone and forcing them into cruelty. Look, even notice verse 16. Notice where the law actually forbids the taking of someone, the taking of human life, and in enslaving them. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Just a very careful reading of what's happening here is that the law is actually working to suggest that this relationship is to actually be one that, is, um, that has a measure of order, warmth, and even protection to it. And this is important. Some have said this idea, this word, actually, if you go back up into verse 1, the slave has a simple range of meaning. Some would translate it, I think, the NIV servant, and then you see the term slave. Um, and there's a range of meaning with this that's important. One scholar has said one way to think about this term in this situation is that there's actually evidence here to support that someone who was in an unfree condition while working off a debt. Uh, all the while in Israel, those who were working in this condition were to be provided significant rights and options. So you could think in term here of a bonded laborer, a bonded laborer who had responsibility to work off his or her debt. And I think that's fair. Well, let me just show you how how actually the text is working to protect the vulnerable. There's four ways that we see in the master-servant relationship quickly that this was to be protected. First of all, this was voluntary. As we just read, verse 16, there is no forceful taking of someone. 
per se, and enslaving them indefinitely. And that's the second thing that we see, that this is an inde- a, a, a determinate period of time. Notice verse 1 and 2. Now, these are the rules that when you shall set before them, when you buy Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. So we see the idea that this was not to be an indefinite situation, that there were temporary guidelines placed upon this relationship. So we see that it was voluntary. We see, secondly, that it's temporary. Thirdly, and here's a big one, there was actually to be a very generous benefit package that was offered to the servant in their release. So you can read it for homework because I've got a lot to get through here. But Deuteronomy chapter 15, I would really challenge you. Verses 12 through 14 picks up this same, it's a synonymous text. It picks up this same idea and that it actually instructs the master, if the slave is to to take the release in the seventh year, that they were to be well provided for on their way out. It's an amazing benefit package. Uh, That gives us evidence, friends, that when you and I take the modern idea of slavery and we impose that on the Bible, we actually find that it's not in step with what's happening in regards to the evil slave trade even today. And so we see that God is working to protect this relationship and protect this person. Fourthly, this practice actually would often work to protect the sanctity of marriage in the family. Now, it's confusing, but there's something also at play here. You have to understand that arranged marriage um, is actually at play throughout some of these chapters. (laughs) Um, I think a lot of notes here. So, like, we might even have to think about recovering that practice in our. Nonetheless, all right, let's let's move on. Um, but really, we we've so um, romanticized marriage today, and rom- romance is a part of it. But we we have a confusing uh, idea here when it comes to marriage. But nonetheless, there seems to be at play in this text the protection and the sanctity of marriage. Also, notice when. Verse 3 and 4, if he comes in single, he can go out single. However, if he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. Do you see that? So there's a sense of protection to this nuclear family that's happening. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. Now that seems a little bit odd, right? Uh Uh-oh. But it's likely that even the lady may have a debt to work off. But what's noted in this is that there's a couple of things that could have happened in regards to fairness with this situation. She was likely also hired, had an obligation to the master. So the husband could do a couple of things. He could wait for her. How many of you remember the story of Jacob and Rachel, right? He could wait for her. He could get a job and actually redeem her, purchase her, which also speaks of like uh, work and earning and how to use your money, right? Right? Or he could actually say what? No, notice what also could happen. But if the slave, verse 5, plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. And so, again, I I think we could get in the weeds of this, but what you have to take away from this is that God is working to care for the vulnerable, to restrict the potential of abuse. And what I think is wonderful here is that we even see that this whole idea is completely foreign to what we think of when it comes to the issue of slavery. And I would say that God is working to protect the slave and the servant in this issue. So uh, let me be clear. Oppressive cruelty was and is forbidden of God's people in this relationship. The Bible does not promote this evil type of slavery that we often think of. Let's be very clear. That is an evil that we should work against, pray against, and recognize. But all of the Bible works to protect the servant in his relationship. In light of this, we should simply note. So how does this become practical? There's a lot of ways. I I would say one way that it should become practical. And it's, it's not a far jump. But if you have any authority, any responsibility over someone, then you and I should understand that there is human dignity, should be human dignity in that relationship. And we should not be the type of people who work in any measure to create abuse and harm over the people that we're responsible for. Does that make sense? That's not a far jump. That culture in our institutions, churches, workplace matters. 
how we treat each other. Matt, and if, so even the young folks coming up, if God grants you the opportunity to lead people, then you be very thoughtful in that relationship and how you work that out. Amen? It's not a far jump in regards to application. So slaves, masters, a lot of ink there. Secondly, there's another group of vulnerable that we see in the text that are to be protected. We see that the Bible actually teaches us that women are to be protected and valued by the law. So there's a lot we could say here. But the Bible goes on and on that women are valuable, made in the image of God, and we, we should be the type of people who see that. The Bible does not support misogynistic, oppressive behavior towards women. It actually works to raise the esteem and honor of women. It's almost certain that what's happening in this next section that we're about to read is that even in arranged marriage situations, the father, the family, is actually working to improve the station, the livelihood of the daughter. So let's look at the next section quickly. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, I know that we could recall there, but hopefully you're more thinking than just the sting. But as he does this, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who has, has designated for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed... He shall have no rights to sell her to foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, he shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Again, complicated, very technical, but very important. One of the things that we see, though, is that in this situation... God is, again, acting to protect the vulnerable. That in this relationship, likely this arranged marriage, the concept, although it's difficult for us, is, is very clear that there are three ways that this lady is protected. Quickly, one, the family could ransom her, right? Or she could not be sold to foreigners. She is to be treated as a daughter with the full rights of the family. And if the arrangement was broken... She is to be provided for, okay? So again, there's complications here. You may have questions. I hope that it maybe puts you on a track of studying deeper about what's happening, but let me just get to the point, okay? Men are to care for women, not abuse them. They are to care for them. Let me say this very clearly. So thinking for us as a ch at, the church, at church, at Hope Church, we should defend the honor of women. We should honor them with dignity. We should respect them, and they are not lesser than us. We should reject male superiority and be thoughtful that in the world and in the culture and sadly in the church, sometimes this isn't the norm. But they are vulnerable. This situation contextually would create vulnerability for them in their arranged marriage, and the Bible's actually working to protect them. Okay, women are to be protected. They're vulnerable. Thirdly, we are to see even later on that another segment of society, the refugee and the foreigner is to be protected. So jump all the way to chapter 22. One verse, quickly, notice verse 21. 22, 21, another category of people who are vulnerable. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. And then he, can, he gives us the condition or the, he substantiates this directive. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Let me just say clearly that foreigners, refugees, are to be protected. That God's people are to care about those who have been displaced. And this is important. Well, why is that the case? I love how he supports this and substantiates this in our own identity. The problem is, is that so many of us don't understand the terms of the gospel in the sense that we were a foreigner and a refugee. Um... We were once outside looking in. And this is a segment of society increasingly so. And I would just say, point to, to modern folks, increasingly in the global world, and because of sinfulness and depravity, you're going to continue to see migration of people. And I get it, and I understand the conversations about borders and all of that, and there's legitimacy in thinking through some of that practicality. But could I just call us as God's people... In the thoughtfulness about either the political realm or the practical realm, 
to also be the type of people who want to see people cared for and the gospel make it to them. Please begin to nuance your conversations about people who are different and the global trans, transmi, uh, 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 transfer of people to have a gospel focus, to have a gospel consideration. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking wise people. But please, as God's people in the local church, begin to understand that those people are made in the image of God just like you. And even don't even use the term those people. All right, I'm going to throw that out. I don't know why I said that. Big, ah, can we get like an X? <laughs> ah. All right. There's so many notes. You know, who knows what you're going to get today, All right? The foreigner, okay. All right, a couple more groups quickly. Vulnerable, the foreigner. The poor are to be carried, cared for. 20, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Notice this, so skip on over. <clears throat> the poor <clears throat> are to be cared for. Uh, actually, verse 10, verse 10 of 23. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. I love uh, this agrarian idea, which is central in the text. But the seventh year, notice, you shall let it rest and lie fallow. Now, why? Why should you not plant and harvest the seventh year? That the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. How many of you in your Christian conversations have said that work is good and we should teach people to work so that they can eat? Anybody want to say that? We've had that conversation before. Okay, you can be honest because I've had it too, okay? Like work is a biblical thing, to, you know, it's teach, the people, teach people to fish, right? It's a good, right, biblical ethic. <clears throat> That's not what this text is calling for. Wow, right? So pump the brakes. Think about this. Yes, principally, but there's also other principles. That the, that the field was, and then even to an Old Testament image of where the edges of the field were not to be gleaned so that the poor could receive nourishment. We just suggest to you that the poor are vulnerable, increasingly so. We should be the type of people who care for them. And I can hear all the conversations now. But let me just suggest to you that as God blesses us, we should be the type of people who are thoughtful about our responsibility, both as a church and as people, to consider those who are vulnerable. Two more groups, quickly, the fatherless. <clears throat> Very practical. Back to 22. Chapter 22, 22 and 24. Notice. Chapter 22, 20, 22 and 23. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn. Now notice this. And I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. I mean, that's, that doesn't take, I don't even know, I have to know Hebrew. <laughs> I would just suggest that God's people have to understand that the fatherless and the widow are extremely vulnerable. You see, the highest privilege of the gospel is to be adopted into his family. And as a natural result, we should be the type of people who seek to care for the vulnerable, to care for the fatherless, to care for the widow. Um, honestly, I think that the last 10 to 15 years, and I, I could be in my segment of the world, so this is maybe a little bit of a confession. The, the adoption and foster emphasis seems to have waned. Now, this may not be true. Ever. It seems to have waned a little bit. Every year, we set aside funds to help with the idea of foster and adoption. And through this text, I've been praying that those funds would be exhausted. And they haven't been. Food for thought. You may not have to, you don't have to adopt or foster to actually care for the fatherless either. Just, there's big conversation. There are so many functionally fatherless kids in our community. Heart for Kids is a big ministry that helps a lot of those kids. Um, 
there's, it, 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 is, it is at earthquake proportions, the amount of kids in our community that the home being broken is, I don't even know what to do with it. Now, I know that we're not called to solve every problem. I'm just suggesting to you that I think we all should be a little bit more uncomfortable with both the fatherless here and across the world and the widows that are in need. I know that sometimes we give attention to the fatherless. I would suggest that the aged as well should have equal attention. <clears throat> so, for the worker, we advocate for just and fair work environment. Let me try to summarize this. Um, we reject misogynistic practices. We defend the equality and rights of women. We care for the refuge, refugee. We serve the widows and the fatherless in our community. And I just want to say thank you, because here's the thing. I don't want this to feel... <clears throat> I know a lot of your stories, and you're seeking to do these things. And I just want to commend you. Maybe you're on the outside, and it isn't important to you. Maybe this would stir your heart for the right things. You see, the church does not adopt the cultural adaptations of justice because it's popular. We actually follow what God instructs for us and we protect the vulnerable. This should be our story. Secondly, though, we are to hold the guilty accountable. We are to hold the guilty accountable that behavior, this next section, 21, 22, and 23, shows us that behavior matters, that punishment should fit the crime. How is it that unethical behavior is to be dealt with in the society? So let me give you another preliminary thought here before we look at a couple of these areas. Can I suggest to you that we have to actually believe that people are morally accountable or should be? A major problem in the application of some of what we're about to look, look at is that we actually think that men and women are good and that any type of punitive action is immoral. Like we have the whole script flipped in our society. And we have to be thoughtful. So a couple of areas that we see, murderers, the violent, thieves, and sexually deviant. So four quick sections. First of all, the issue of murder are those who would take life. Go back to 21 and look at 12 through 14. 12 through 14. Notice he goes from this issue of slavery to arranged marriage. And then he goes, whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. So that's sort of scenario one, right? Scenario two. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to which you may flee. This unintentional um, idea of violence and murder. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from the altar that he may die. And then later on, what's called the law of Talion, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, I would just suggest to you that you see really a couple of scenarios in this text. You have intentional and unintentional murder. This idea of premeditated murder is popping up. And then this idea of accidental death pops up. But what you see in this is that intent matters. Intent matters. Most of the surrounding, what's interesting about this also is that most of the surrounding cultures in this day did not establish this type of judicial fairness. And so here's where the idea of capital punishment in the text arises later. That the death penalty may seem harsh, right? But it's important to think carefully about this. Quote, God values all human life above all things. The death penalty was actually invoked not out of indifference for human life, but rather because human life is of, of the highest value. The idea that a life for life does not express vengefulness but rather the idea only that the payment should match the crime, a human life for a human life. Because what could happen in other societies is that, um, that they could go beyond, that vengefulness could happen. And actually, the death penalty, the law of Italian, is actually working to restrict behavior so that it is equal in its consequences. Now, again, I think that there are times that Christians should very, very adamantly oppose because the process can, be, can fall. Does that make sense? Like it's still fallen, and so we have to be thoughtful about this. But let me suggest to you that there is accountability in the law towards behavior against murder and taking of life. 
that justice, for justice to be a reality, severity has to happen. There has to be this issue. So we see that. Violence. So another category is violence. So murder, more can be said about that, but quickly, violence. It's interesting, last night on this subject, I went to my second hockey game, um, the Indy Fuel, and it, I'm like, this is like, I, we're with a couple friends from here, and I'm like, I'm just thinking about my sermon. I'm like, there were fights, and it, here's what's interesting. Do you realize that it's actually expected at a hockey game to see a fight? Ellie, I mean, so don't take this wrong. Ellie, our 10-year-old girl, she's like, Dad, if they break out in a fight, can you video it? <laughs> I know some of you are thinking, I'm, we are not the best parents. <laughs> I know, all right? I was like, and it was like, but what was so, so there's so, okay, violence, a lot here in the text. But verse, chapter 21, 18 through 26, you see that God actually assumes that men are going to fight. So just... Some of you are like, can we do that after the service? No, no, no. But the punishment in this text, I'll have you read it on your own at home, 18 through 26, should fit the crime. So much so, how odd, that if you win the fight, you're actually to pay the loser. Like, give him or her money. Right? So that, how odd is that? So it's expected, but it's restricted. Even the innocent bystanders, such as the lady who may have been pregnant, is to be protected. There should be restitution. And what's happening here, again, in all of these consequences is that uh, certain things are being restricted so that you wouldn't go beyond. So, for example, although it wouldn't necessarily be literal, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, instead of us thinking of, well, that's an evil impulse. No, 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 no. It's actually working to restrict going beyond. And that's what's happening in this issue of violence. That the advance, advancement of justice actually has negative consequences, but they are to be restricted. Monetary fines. And even in this, we don't see, uh, we just see civility at play. Furthermore, I would suggest on the death penalty and back to violence, uh, let me just show you. Go to um, 22. This is important. 22, 23. Notice how this is not just a personal sort of vengeful Response, when a man strive together and they hit a pregnant woman, so there's the assumption that men are going to fight. I love the level of detail here, don't you? So that her children come out. One is the notice that the, the, what some would call the fetus is actually called a baby in the womb, so food for thought, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as notice the judges determined. Now, this is important. So there's civility and societal structures at play. It's not that just Jamie can determine what the restitution is. So there's a measure of civility and society that's at play here, not just our own personal inclinations, which I think that that's important. This is how God orders the world. And so we see that violence is a part of this and that, um, that there is responsibility. Next, thieves and property rights. Quickly, you can look at verses uh, chapter 22, 1 through 4. Here is where, if you read that, you'll notice that in regards to property rights, there is no death penalty. So, what's happening is the Bible elevates. It's interesting, we flip that in our culture. Um, even when you get to the issue of bestiality, we've flipped things in our culture. Um, what you see in property rights is nothing in that this seg segment rises to the issue of taking a life. So God works to elevate human life above everything else. More food for thought. And then lastly, the sexually deviant. The sexually deviant. If you go over to chapter 22, um, chapter 22, and when you think about this issue of the sexually deviant, Oh, I've lost my place here. So many passages. Um, we'll get there. Um, sh oh, yeah, chapter 22, verse 16. Thank you for your patience this morning. Uh, notice verse 16. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If, he fa if her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay equal money to the bridegroom for virgins. A lot here, but I would just suggest to you that in this and then on down, you see this issue, verse 19, whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. And then you see the death penalty for sorcery. 
What I would suggest to you on these two, verse 16, 17, and 19, is that the sexually deviant are to be held accountable. And in this, we see that the man is not necessarily manipulated. There's probably consensual things that are at play here, but God is basically saying to the man that we are to have regard, that in this situation, there is to be regard for the worth of the woman. So much so that he is responsible to marry her, right? There are consequences. Notice that there are consequences to premarital sex. God is calling us to be self-controlled and honor women. So in a culture, I would suggest to you, that's lost all sense of sexual morality, we need to show a better way. Same thing with bestiality. This idea of, um, it's just, it's horrid, right? That the sexually prescribed morals in the Bible, that we see this, that we have no right to alter them. The degradation of mankind in this regards is something that we should never accept. Bestiality is a degradation on the imago Dei. It's an offense towards God, which in God's economy is warranted of the death penalty. So what I would suggest to try to wrap this section up is simply this. If we're going to see justice fill our streets, we have to restore a sense of civility where we advocate for morality in society. We need to remember that we are guilty. By the way, it's easy for us to read this, all of this, and begin to point fingers on the outside, isn't it? Jesus would take all of this deeper, right? He would take it deeper. And we need to remember, if we've ever harbored hatred towards someone, we are guilty of murder. If we've ever looked at a woman lustfully, we are the sexually deviant. We are guilty. We need to be rescued from eternal consequences of our sin. And the only way to be rescued is through Jesus Christ. So before you take this and go off on a tangent to correct the culture, may I suggest to all of us that we look inside first? And understand that the only answer to our sinful inclinations and heart is Jesus Christ. And that's where I want to conclude. Where is it? What is it that we should maintain as God's people? A priority of holiness. So the last text, quickly, chapter 23. How does this section end? Verse 12. Excuse me, verse 13. Verse 13. Bear with me. That... Notice what happens at the conclusion of this. Pay attention to all that I have said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Three times in the year, he lists the three feasts here. You shall keep feasts to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread as I commanded you. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall keep the feast of the first fruits of your labor. Of what you sow in the field, you shall keep the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in front of the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year you shall make your males appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. The beast of, excuse me, the best of the first fruits of your ground shall bring into the, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Wow. A lot here, but let me just suggest to you what should be our ultimate priority by which gives us the lens to live rightly. It is that we are to worship him alone, verse 13. That if our eyes towards justice and equity are going to be clear, the only way that they are clear is that our eyes are exclusively on him. Secondly, we are to worship him with a generous offering and we are to give him our best. And we are to worship him with purity. Nothing leavened, verse 18. This is who we are. These are the matters of the heart, right? These are the matters of the heart that we must attend to. One writer said it this way, that the inner life, please don't miss this, the inner life is something actionably legislation cannot touch. Here's what that means. When you look at the conclusion of this, where it climaxes, is in God's people's, God's people's relationship to him first. If we're going to get this right of living for Jesus, then it's a matter of our heart and our orientation towards him. The only way that we're going to make Jesus look glorious and the only way that we're going to obey this and put it in its right place is when we live in light of Jesus Christ. You see, it could be said this way in conclusion. Because of Jesus, we will care for the vulnerable. Because of Jesus, we will advocate for ethical responsibility. Because of Jesus, 
we will ultimately live to love him with all of our heart, soul, and strength. And because of Jesus, we will live in such a way that we love our neighbors and point them to some glorious eternal truths. The only way that we can do this is through the power of Jesus Christ. Do you know this Christ? Because if you don't know this Christ, it doesn't matter how many blogs you read about social justice. It doesn't matter how many rallies you attend. It doesn't matter. It, listen, that doesn't matter. We need Christ to fulfill this. Do you know Christ? That's our prayer and plea together. And let's pray to that end. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have so much to teach us. Lord, thank you that there's so much even detail here. And we pray, God, that, um, Lord, that you would just use your word to teach us. Lord, that we would be lifelong learners. And so, God, we just acknowledge that uh, you care about every area of life. Lord, we see that clearly. Lord, thank you for, Lord, that there is nothing, Lord, it seems as if, um, that you let go, that you, Lord, that you don't care about. And so we pray that you would help us to see that, um, Lord, to live in light of Jesus is to consider all of these areas carefully, thoughtfully. And so, God, we pray that you would empower us by the Spirit to, to make Jesus Christ look glorious. And not only would we have the gospel on our lips, but we would live in such a way that, Lord, we show folks that the gospel transforms our lives. It gives us a different orientation. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that among our people, among our church, for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.